The international press hailed last year's election of Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva as a victory for the Amazon. He'd promised to reach zero deforestation and reinstate the environmental protections that his predecessor, Jair Bolsonaro, had dismantled. But his environmental chops were brought into question by plans of government-controlled oil company Petrobras to drill off Brazil's northern coast in a region known as the Equatorial Margin. And this is particularly controversial because the Equatorial Margin sits very close to the mouth of the Amazon River. Brazil's Environment Ministry initially denied Petrobras permission, but there is a chance it may change its mind under pressure from the Lula government. But recent discoveries show that drilling in the region may well be irresponsible and could threaten valuable and previously unmapped ecosystems off Brazil's coast. My name's Ewan Marshall, Deputy Editor of the Brazilian Report, and this is Explaining Brazil. If you like Explaining Brazil, you should subscribe to The Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. We're an independent organisation funded by our subscribers, and you can help us stay independent and continue to produce award-winning journalism. And if you're already a subscriber, you can go the extra mile and join our Buy Me A Coffee fan page, and in return, you'll get exclusive perks like special newsletters and behind-the-scenes content, as well as a shout-out here in our podcast. And today, I'd like to thank our Buy Me A Coffee members. Tom Nolan, Marta Martins, Pan Ludwig, Leslie Seal, Caroline Hubert, Mark Hillary, John Thomas III, Louis Renz, Erwan Menais, Orlando Black, Steve Knapp, Aaron Berger, James Coney, Karz Vriesvik, Alistair Townsend, Peter Avramson, Jim Awofadeju, Michael Fryer, Mila Renacedo, David Dixon, Jose Ozzy Stankovic, Emerging Market Muser, Yarden Eftak, Tonika Thompson, Anderson Da Silva, Kat Kramer, Peter Suffren, Anna Lund, and someone who wishes to remain anonymous. And our Buy Me A Coffee members come from all over the world, so please, if we're butchering the pronunciation of your name, do send us an email. And if you too believe in the importance of independent journalism, and if you want to hear your name on our podcast, go to buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report and subscribe to one of the membership levels. Click on buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report to learn more. A group of National Geographic explorers recently identified a novel mangrove environment situated on the coast of Amapá State, near the mouth of the Amazon River, a find unparalleled anywhere in the world. And to hear more about this discovery and why it relates to government-backed plans to drill for oil in the equatorial margin, we're delighted to welcome Angelo Bernardino, who's one of the explorers responsible for this new finding. Angelo, thanks a lot for joining us today. If you could just start by introducing yourself and telling the listeners about your discovery and why it's important. So my name is Angelo Bernardino. I'm a National Geographic Explorer and I'm a professor of oceanography here in Brazil, in Espiritu Santo, and actually living and working far away from the Amazon, right, in Southeast Brazil. Uh, but we had a chance to, to work in the Amazon River mouth with mangroves as part of the Perpetual Planet, National Geographic, Perpetual Planet Amazon Expeditions in partnership with Rolex. And this expedition was planned to study and try to understand better the aquatic environments near the Amazon. And mangroves uh, are coastal forests, are tidal forests that grow on tropical coasts. And they are very abundant in Brazil. They are, they have, Brazil has vast mangrove forests uh, as it's a tropical country. And as far as it, as hard as, hard as it, it is to believe, uh, most of the mangroves occur in the Amazon region and they have been pretty underexplored through the years, mostly because they are uh, uh, away from the main, main cities. So we, with this expedition, we tried to understand a little bit more of how the mangroves in the region, in the Amazon region, were linked, potentially linked to the flow of the water throughout the Amazon all the way from the Andes down to the coast. So, um, so we, during the last year, we took this expedition up there in the Amazon River mouth and we, we took a two-week expedition with researchers and, and filmmakers and, you know, and ecologists. 
And we went to try to understand better the mangroves there, try to to measure trees, try to understand be better the ecological systems that are there. And we were surprised to, to find this novel type of mangroves in the Amazon river mouth, which were typically encountered in freshwater uh, areas, right? Mangrove trees are typically found in coastal areas, in saline areas where these trees are adapted to grow. And as we expected, the strong river flow of the Amazon made the environment very different for their adaptation. And we found these novel types of trees, mangrove trees, colonizing these coasts, these areas near the Amazon River. And they were thriving together with freshwater trees, typically found up, up river. So it was very interesting, very surprising that we found these right, right near the coast, where we would expect mangroves to grow under saline environments. So this was exciting uh, because we had we did know that there were mangrove trees in the area, but there weren't so many descriptions, detailed description of how the environment was. You know? So we are very we were very excited to find this in the Amazon uh, last year. And what role do mangrove forests play in ecosystems? Because I mean, I think most of our listeners know more or less what mangrove forests look like, but if you could just give us a clearer idea of their importance. That's a great question. Uh, well, mangroves are, like I said, they are tidal forests. They grow well on the coastlines of tropical areas, tropical countries. And they colonize these areas and they create a very rich environment, right? This environment supports fish, supports birds, supports a, 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 a rich wildlife. And this wildlife, in turn, provides food for people that live near the coast. So mangroves are life-supporting systems. So they create environments where fish and birds and other animals can go and feed and grow up in their, during their early life stages. In the Amazon, for example, these mangroves, there are reports that some of the fish that are caught uh, in the river basin, they grow, they spend some part of their life uh, in the mangroves on the coast before migrating upriver to, to grow and reproduce. So mangroves are critical to, to support many uh, species that are food uh, items, food, there are, there are food items for, for coastal populations, not only on the coast, but also up rivers. So, and also, uh, especially in areas where you have strong ocean conditions, so let's say storm surges or even hurricanes, right? Uh, mangroves, they do help to protect the coastline. They, they support the coast with uh, sedimentation. They grow up this, the coast, they, they accrete soil to protect the coast from sea level rise, for example, which is a, an, a, a, one of the effects of climate change we're observing uh, around the world. And they protect the coastlines from hurricanes. And so they have this benefit of protecting urban infrastructure from damages from strong storms, for example. And you've been working with mangrove forests for years now, right? So, you know, what's, what's the appeal about them for you? Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I mean, I've been working with mangroves for near 10 years now, and I've seen mangroves, many different types of mangroves along the coast of Brazil. Uh, of course, not all mangroves are like the Amazon mangroves. They are, the Amazon mangroves are a different type because they are not only huge, but they thrive in those uh, freshwater environments, as I said. But for example, uh, in urban mangroves here in Southeast Brazil, near Rio, Rio de Janeiro has also many mangroves, we have smaller forests, but they have other importances to, to people, right? They help to, to clean the water, for example. So we have in urban areas where we have a problem with sanitation and sewage, sewage discharge on rivers, mangroves have a, a really important effect on cleaning water and providing clean water for people to both tourism, which, in, which can help tourist, touristic uh, 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 operations and also to, to clean water for drinking, for example. So they have a huge importance uh, for climate, for example, right? They help to remove uh, greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So I, I often say that when you study mangroves, I was used to say that they are one of the most undervalued ecosystems that are on the coasts because people look at them with some, uh, some sort of... of of, uh, of uh, how can I say, of, uh, of a, a dis uh, an unpleasant environment because they are, they have mosquitoes, you know, they have this uh, strange smell, which is, which is because they have a lot of organic matter in their soils. 
So they are very undervalued and they are one of the first ecosystems to be destroyed for urban infra infrastructure, for example, to build ports and to build, you know, uh, buildings on, on urban areas. And, and yet they have a huge value in terms of, of ecosystem services they provide to us. And Angelo, the reason that this discovery has taken on added importance now is that the Brazilian federal government and the state-controlled oil company Petrobras, they seem hell-bent on drilling for oil in the so-called equatorial margin, which is very close to where your discovery was made. So what would be the risks of such an endeavor? Well, um, I think as with every offshore oil exploration, there are some operational and management risks. Uh, so the industry usually they can control well the operational risks, although we, we've seen recently what happens when you have uh, accidental spills. We've seen the Gulf of Mexico, for example, uh, uh, the Macondo blowout. And so in, this was in 10 years ago or something like that, right? So uh, especially when you have operations that occur offshore and at great depths, there's also a risk of uh, some operational risks that are difficult to to, to manage if you have an accident accident or, or blowout, right? And, but also for sure in that region, specifically in the Amazon, that's a region that we are still making discoveries such as these mangroves we did last year. You know, it's an area that is very remote, uh, not only from the biggest urban centers in terms of logisticals, logistics, but also in terms of, of scientific discoveries. We know very little of what's there, not only on the coast, such as these mangroves, but also uh, on the deep sea in the region. So there's virtually not, uh, there's virtually, we don't know a lot, or we don't know most of the things that grow up uh, offshore there. They are living on the seabed down there. So the management for that is is very difficult, right? So you, you can't manage uh, exploration in an area where you don't know what's what lives in there. So that's the most difficult question about this exploration, I would say. So we need, we, and it's unfortunate that it, we are aiming to explore that area before we have the chance to to understand uh, and and study the, the ecosystems that thrive in there. So yeah, I find that fascinating because we often hear that there are probably thousands upon thousands of undiscovered plant and animal species in the Amazon, but whenever I hear that, I'm imagining the deepest, thickest core of the rainforest, you know, maybe somewhere that humans have never even ventured before. But what you're saying is that these discoveries can be made on the coast. Yes. So, you know, why hasn't this region been mapped already? This is fascinating, actually. Uh, as you said, there are people living in there, many people living there, and they depend on mangroves and fishing for their lives. So they basically, they get what they eat every day, right? Uh, and they go and go fishing and go... Uh, catch some forest products and they depend also on, uh, on some agricultural lands next to mangroves and they trade. They trade fish for everything they need from the, they can get in the region. And our expedition there last year uh, was the first scientific expedition in the region for those mangroves. And with our research uh, in, in, as part of this project of the Professional Planet uh, uh, Project, uh, we had the chance to map mangroves that were not even mapped by satellite. And this was really interesting. I mean, usually what what people do, they use satellites to map forests throughout the globe, right? Uh, but these satellites, they have algorithms, they have numbers, and they, they try to uh, identify forests by their color, let's say, right? And uh, a lot of the, the forests that were mapped before our project, before we had the chance to, to go there, were mapped as, as varsity forests, as freshwater forests. So only after we went there and we, after we published it and described these mangrove, new novel mangroves, that people realized that those were mangrove forests, not tidal freshwater forests. So this gives us an example of how remote that area is. And the, the reason is that there are no roads. There's, there's no access to roads in many of those locations. And people, they, they go around by smaller boats, uh, fishing boats mostly. And, and that's one of the reasons that the, the mangroves have, have been preserved so far, for instance, right? So the mangroves, the protection of the mangroves there is fantastic. The conservation status is really amazing. And one of those reasons is that because that region is remote. So uh, we are now in, in really into a new frontier, right? Where, uh, and you were right, people 
think that the Amazon basin <laughs> is is a mystery, but you, we, for sure we have many mysteries on the coast and on the deep sea there too. It, it's the same is true for the deep sea areas where they want to extract oil. There's nothing, there's no, not a one expedition, scientific expedition that have described any ecosystem below depths of 200 meters. We know nothing. And circling back to Petrobras and their oil extraction plans, the company seems pretty convinced that it will get the go-ahead to drill. You know, it's included several of these projects on the recently launched growth acceleration program. Is there a way to do it safely? I think, as I said, I think we should be asking uh, other questions, right? I think, why, why do you need that oil for, right? We are in, in a climate emergency and we are... We are seeing like rapid changes uh, in our climate, and we know there's vast scientific data supporting that fossil fuels are the cause of the climate emergence we're we are seeing. We are seeing record-breaking temperatures everywhere. We are seeing drier climates. We so and and we have and because of fossil fuels, we're gonna experience experience drastic changes in our way of living. So. There's also evidence from scientific data that we don't need more oil to be extracted. We don't need new oil projects. And that's different than saying that we need to stop producing oil, right? We can live, we can make an, a clean energetic transition with the oil that's already uh, being produced globally. So I think uh, that's for sure that scientific data shows that we, we can move to a clean energy uh, future and the government should be putting in their energy into that instead of uh, of, of amplifying, of making new oil extraction projects. And during last year's election campaign, some of the biggest promises made by now President Lola were environment related, with the examples of pledging zero deforestation by 2030 and bringing in Marina Silva as his environment minister. Now, environmental defenders have been let down by Lola and his Workers' Party before most notably in the construction of the Belo Monte Hydroelectric Dam, a project that just seems completely indefensible from an environmental standpoint. Is this another case of the Workers' Party letting their environmentalist supporters down? I think in this instance, like, uh, I think there needs to be, if the government is going further with these projects of exploring the offshore oil there in the Amazon, we will need to have uh, better scientific investigations to understand what's in there, right? We need to understand what ecosystems may be potentially exposed to harm should this uh, offshore oil exploration proceed. Uh, there's still so much we don't know in the area. There's still so much we need to understand better to, like I said, to make proper management of this uh, potentially uh, exploration of the region. So I hope that we consider this. We consider that uh, we have uh, not only sensitive ecosystems such as these mangroves on the coast, near these, uh, these operations, but we also have many vulnerable coastal communities living in there and their subsistence is, uh, uh, is strongly linked to the ecosystem health in the region. So with this, these people, the voices and their, their living, the way of living, they need to be considered if this exploration is going further. Right, um, And this is one of the main messages we've seen in these last meetings that are, have happened recently in Pará uh, from the government of the South American governments, the Amazon, Amazonian governments. And as we could see, many uh, the populations, the, 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 the indigenous populations, they were very worried about these projects and they must be listened. Uh, and both science and the local uh, indigenous people, they need to be listened uh, and and included in the, in the projects of uh, if these projects are going to be uh, carried further. And Angelo, after this discovery, what's next for you? What are you working on now? My plans are actually to continue to explore uh, the, the value of mangroves and, and, and marine ecosystems in the Amazon River mouth. As I said, there's vast uh, unknowns. Uh, there are many unknowns in the area. We don't know uh, how these ecosystems thrive, the links these ecosystems have with the Amazon River Basin, uh, which are some aspects that we are studying right now. And we're also very interested in understanding better the Amazon plume, right? The vast plume of sediments and, and particles that the Amazon uh, throws in the, in, the, in the injects in the Atlantic Ocean. 
this is an area that's very, uh, uh, very unknown and very uh, intriguing to me as a marine scientist, as a marine ecologist. So we see that even the Amazon, uh, we typically think that the Amazon is untouched by humans, right, because of its uh, of its vastness and, and, and remoteness, but it's not. We have seen, we are experiencing vast rapid changes in climate and in the ways human, humans interact with, with these ecosystems. So I hope that our research in partnership with National Geographic and Rolex and these expeditions, we hope that we can further uh, spark interest in these ecosystems and show how important they are for life uh, in, in the Amazon coast. Yeah, I actually had to Google the Amazon River plume while you were talking there. I mean, that sounds fascinating. We'll have to get you back on at some point to tell us more. That's great. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you can see it by satellite. It's a huge area of sediment uh, particles that are expelled from the Amazon River mouth. And it carries a lot of, of organic materials and influence life for thousands of kilometers away from the Amazon. So that's one of the things we're, we're discovering now, like we're trying to understand that we, we need to, to, to understand that the Amazon is not confined to its forests, right? The Amazon has a huge uh, expansion through the, this plume of sediments into the Atlantic Ocean and even into the Caribbean Ocean. So the, what happens in the Amazon River has, uh, has influenced even uh, in the lives of millions of people that live thousands of, of kilometers away from the Amazon River. Thanks very much, Angelo. A pleasure to have you with us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. If you like Explaining Brazil, please give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. It only takes a second and it will help us reach a wider audience. Or better yet, subscribe to The Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. We have a subscription-based business model and your memberships fuel our journalism and keep us going and growing. And thanks to our subscribers, we've been able to cover Brazil and Latin America extensively and our work has won and been shortlisted for several international journalism awards. More recently, our newsletters won the best newsletter prize in the Americas from the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers for a small or local newsroom. And in order to keep doing that work, we need your support. So go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. I'm Ewan Marshall. Thanks for listening and Explaining Brazil will be back next week.